You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay, everybody, we are live. So making convicting a murderer came out on the Daily Wire with Candace Owens as the narrator. And they are taking on the Making a Murder series franchise, <laughs> I'd call it. And it was a big draw on Twitter last night. Over a million people watched it the last time I looked, which was pretty early on. I'm sure it's much bigger now. And I thought one of the most hilarious reactions to it came from Stephen Avery's former lawyer, Dean Strand. Oh, no, not Dean Strand. It's, it's Jerry Buting. Excuse me. And I'm just, let me see if I can find it. Give me a second. So he writes, theme of convicting murderer is to trash Avery based largely on inadmissible rumors and gossip. One interviewee expressly, expresses, expressly stated, excuse me, Quote, it was just bar talk. I had no proof that she said it or proof that it really did happen. It's just what my friend told her, unquote. So I write, uh, I go, I write, LOL, the convicted murderer is being defamed. And that's really what he's arguing there is that it, it is making the convicted killer and grapist, I guess that would be the YouTube friendly way of saying it, right? Defaming his good name. Like you can only defame someone <laughs> if they have a character to defame. I mean, that's what he's concerned with. And he wasn't concerned with the fact that the whole making a murderer franchise re-victimized Teresa Hallback's family. He was okay with that. But when you start talking talking trash about Stephen Avery, watch out. And uh, it's also had other reactions, other kind of legal issues. And when I come back from the break, we'll talk about it. I'll meet you on the other side. If you are enjoying this episode of my True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. So one of my criticisms of convicting a murderer was that it focused so much on the people who were who are Stephen Avery supporters and not so much the lawyers and the movement that does this fraud. And how about the filmmakers? How about the entire wrongful conviction genre as a as a thing. I mean, you know, it starts out like serial, you know, this is a call from Stephen Avery, just like this is a call from Adnan Syed, but it makes no reference. So it's making it seem like making a murderer was only a sensation because it happened 
during the Christmas break and people were at home. But it comes after a long line of these kind of documentaries. And Sean Reich, who directed A Murder in the Park, knows all about innocence fraud. And it's like he's totally forgotten everything he knows and is going to this with a rosy picture of the wrongful conviction movement and these quashed convictions. And I, th I saw a tweet that I really thought summed it up by Alyssa Fleck. She says, we're living in a crazy time when convicted murderers can be sprung from prison because of PR campaigns masquerading as objective journalism and then become world famous superstars who literally profit off their crimes. If you're a defense attorney with an obviously guilty client, the smartest thing you can do is call Netflix. I mean, if that's not the truth, I don't know what is. And I don't know how Alyssa Fleck gets it. And Sean Reich and Candace Owens haven't seen sort of a pattern here with these kind of documentaries or series, maybe a better way to put it. So the other legal issue, and I mentioned this yesterday, but which is with the using of these supporters, one of them, Casey, she has a channel. I've, she's also a West Memphis Three supporter. I, a long time ago, years ago, I did a live on her West Memphis, some of her West Memphis Three content. And luckily she didn't have a problem <laughs> with me then. Excuse me, I had a cough. Um, she writes, wow, Sean Reck, you put people in your TV show without permission. One would think that when you promote a TV show, specifically, quote, uh, hashtag convicting a murderer as content that promotes truth, you would at least first consult with the people you're using to grift. Which is funny because, again, she has no problem with... Uh, Moira Demos or Laura Riccardi making money off making a murderer or all the other people who did, all the lawyers who went on tour, Dean Strang and Jerry Buting went on tour, their big speaking fees that they got, that becoming a celebrity, no problem. But <clears throat> she's really mad that they used her content without permission. And Sean Wright writes back, oh, you're so important if you're a paralegal if you're a paralegal, talk to some of your attorneys. So he's saying, sue me. And, and what he's saying by you're so important, and I really didn't touch on this yesterday, is like, you don't have the money to come, come bring down the Daily Wire. You don't have the money to sue me. And that seems to be, <clears throat> excuse me, that seems to be the issue with, or maybe one way of looking at why convicting a murderer really doesn't go after any of these lawyers that perpetuated what I'd call this innocence fraud of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, Laura Nareider, not yet, at least not in the first three episodes. If it happens in the last eight, I will apologize. But doesn't seem to be going after them because of course they have the money and the means to sue. So, you know, that's what it looks like when you use that kind of content. But I don't know, you know, I don't know whose content was paid for in this and whose wasn't and what other kinds of content they're going to use. But it is an interesting kind of side issue in, in this convicting a murderer that I'm going to be keeping an eye on. Let's take another quick break. And when I get back, we're going to go through the first beginning of convicting a murderer. Stay tuned. Meet you on the other side. If you are enjoying this episode of my True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today.
If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. So, you know, I've been looking at this wrongful conviction movement for the past five years and every celebrated case that I can get my hands on, I've been digging into the transcripts and case files when they're available, anything I can get my hands on to get to the bottom of these cases. And I haven't found one case of innocence. So I have concluded that this is the biggest fraud in America that no one is talking about. But this series knows that it's hugely popular. So they're not going to go against the narrative. And this Stephen Avery's narrative is intricately in it is woven in with his wrongful conviction you can't divide the two without exploring it but never ask the question which i think is a really important question why wasn't alan convicted if he was the one who perpetrated the sa on penny bernstein why wasn't he convicted it was it because he was already in prison, but it looks like he's going to get out now. So what happens now? And many people think of that as it was an assault, but it wasn't what we think of as in a traditional kind of essay, if you know what I mean. And uh, I think it's interesting to ask the question, why, you know, isn't it interesting? You know, my understanding is that Alan was always the alternative suspect for Team Avery. Isn't it interesting that they turned out to be right? I don't know. You tell me. It's just, you know, never filled in. So let's start with, so the beginning of this documentary starts off talking about Laura Riccardi, who is the co-director of this. And they cut to an interview with Laura Riccardi and her partner, Maura Demos. And they're being interviewed and they ask, I think both of them, the interviewer asked why she made making a murderer. And she answers, I think in the broadest sense, I just wanted to help people. I just wanted to give back to society. She says actually before that. And then she says, I just wanted to help people. So, and it takes that on face value. What if she had seen this whole host of innocence fraud, what I'd call, you know, innocence fraud being perpetrated throughout the country and thought, I'm really tired of becoming a lawyer, right? Because as Dean Strang introduced it, and maybe with a little bit of projection on his part, a lawyer who was not particularly happy, that's how he described Laura Riccardi, not particularly happy with being a lawyer. But it sure makes her look good and sure is a good virtue signal, no, to say that I wanted to help people, I wanted to do good, right? And I think it's actually, it sounds a lot better. Excuse me, I had to cough. It sounds a lot better than saying right? I wanted to make a lot of money. I was sick of being a lawyer. I was looking for an equally, a way I could make as equally as much money and get out a convicted killer in the process, right? Of course, she would say a wrongfully convicted killer, but the public is in love with this story. And to say anything against it and to ask any questions about these wrongful convictions 
including Avery's first Avery's supposed wrongful conviction is to be instantly unpopular. And I will bet that I am the only one who is going to be asking these questions. And Candace Owens kind of doubles down on this, takes this narrative as fact. So when she's introducing the phenomenon of making a murder and the roots of it, she says, Netflix making a murderer. Well, I would say it all began with the ambitions of one woman. So <laughs> it's not that it's a giant movement. It's a giant, what I'd call a giant criminal enterprise of people, <laughs> a criminal racket, right? A mafia. It's just one woman. It's not that we've seen like so many of these wrongful conviction things, making money for people, media, right? True crime entertainment. It's just that it was one woman who just didn't want to be a lawyer anymore and she wanted to do good. Just one do-gooder started this. Right? And I also think it's fair to say that it began with her emotions as well. So, and I think that's a very Candace Owens thing to say for what I know about Candace Owens is that she is a woman who likes to go after other women and say that, our emotional side is what brings us down. It is it's what it's it's sort of a problem with women that they get too emotional and they they can't be rational and they, they falsely accuse people of doing things. And I've also heard her talk about our unfair criminal justice system with no explanation at all. It's just unfair. It's just out there, just accept it. So it's now it's the problem that two women directed this. And of course, this is going to be rational and fair because a man's directing it, but Candace is involved. So what about your emotions, Candace, right? So just kind of some interesting setups and things to look at. And while, while you're watching it, and I don't know how many people have seen it. The first two episodes are out. It's thinking about having a kind of, watch party if people are interested if, if you, I've not everyone's seen it yet um but here again Candace Owens doubles down whoop sorry um here you have a guy who's leaving prison after have been wrongfully convicted and then she talks about how sorry she felt for Stephen Avery and I have no problem with her describing how she felt watching a mur making a murderer my issue is With Candace Owens calling Stephen Avery, calling it a, a wrongful conviction without ever exploring it, because this is the issue, right? This is the issue is that so many, so much of this media and so many of these campaigns are done for guilty clients. And when the DNA comes back, like in the Julius Jones case for the Innocence Project clients or Purvis Payne, those cases, they don't walk away. They double down on innocence. They say, oh, no, Kevin Cooper in California, same thing. Oh, no, this just this. They just come up with another theory as to why it just proves their case. And doubles down on it. I mean, that should be the end right there. The end of the the end of the campaign. Walk away. But they don't. But because it has such money and such power behind it and so many lawyers involved, everyone is afraid to talk. And so we have an emperor's have no clothes situation. And take a quick break. And I'll meet you back on the other side of the break.
If you are enjoying this episode of my True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. But I mean, you know, we have people like Jim Clemente saying, oh, I like I never had any idea that Stephen Avery might be guilty until convicting a murder or something like that. Like, wow, convicting a murder really showed me the way. When if you look up Stephen Avery guilt, there's an ABC piece on it. There's multiple pieces and they're not long to read. Top five reasons, you know, top 10 things left out and making a murderer, top five things that prove Stephen Avery's guilt. The truth is out there and it's been out there. And one of my real issues is that this makes it look like, oh, if only, if only we had known, if only the truth had come out sooner. And the big problem is that so many people were convinced by this and they show, you know, endless interviews with fans of making a murderer like this guy Dave who was a supporter I guess before looks like he's going to turn into a non-supporter uh, this guy John puzzled by it all like all these online characters who's also an attorney like you gotta wonder what kind of law this guy practiced right I, I assume he's puzzled by why this is a phenomenon since Stephen Avery is <laughs> so obviously guilty, but I don't know. But it makes it look like Joe Blow's opinion in Timbuktu is really the issue, not these lawyers who who clean up, who make money from this kind of content and go from case to case to case. Right now, Jerry Buting is representing a really guilty guy in Wisconsin who, who, uh, who killed his wife. So what are, you know, it's like they go from, they go from one, one guilty client to the next, but I guess that's, but Laura and Ryder also been involved in Adnan Syed, Brendan Dassey's lawyer. I mean, they seem to go from one, one campaign to the next. And if you sign on to one, you have to sign on to, to all of them. So let's just take a quick look at the Murder in the Park trailer and then a little piece of Convicting a Murderer. So this is a Murder in the Park for those of you who haven't seen it. Just this is the trailer. So this will give you a little bit of the idea of the background of Sean Reich. This is the only piece of mainstream uh, media that I know of in, in film about innocence fraud. And of course, there's Martin Pribe's book, Crooked City, which I highly, highly recommend. But this this documentary i mean this is the he goes from from this to to convicting a murder and it seems like a great it's going to be a great fit right so let me show you to free a wrongfully convicted man 48 hours away from being executed has got to be the great dream of any reporter anywhere. There was one problem, though. It was one big lie. A bunch of kids who had taken a course on journalism dug up the information that was there available to the police. We went and we reenacted the crime, and we found out that the eyewitness couldn't have seen it at all. 
they were heroes. The case was a pivotal moment in the abolition of the death penalty in Illinois. I'm commuting the sentence of all death row inmates. I said, there's something going on, but what's going on is not what you see on TV. The journalism professor intentionally leaves out the most important fact of all. They seized on the name of a guy with no evidence and concluded he was the real killer. He tells me that a man is getting ready to die for something I did. She told us that she had been there when her husband committed the crime. I have two guns. Totally inconsistent. The victims were shot five times. How many shots did you hear? Really three, maybe four. I don't know. This case had a motive behind it bigger than the crime. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. These guys are saying they'll help me get out of prison. They'll say whatever they want me to say. We got the right guy. Anthony Porter killed those two people. It's an utter outrage. It's justice upside down. What would make this right is my freedom. And he got it. So that's all story Simon, the the man, the Medeal Innocence Project Clinic. There are people, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of this film, and an opinion of many who looked at this story, framed and innocent all story Simon in order to release a guilty Anthony Porter. And isn't it funny when they say this had a bigger motive, right? This had a bigger motive than this story. Well, there's a bigger motive behind making a murderer than just freeing Stephen Avery. Because it's to preserve, I believe, in my opinion, it's to preserve this movement and the and the good name of the movement because it certainly doesn't look good when Avery is splashed over the New York Times right? Saying he's out, right? He was formally, let's say, welcomed home, DNA evidence used to clear local. So this is, right? So it goes from this, like the celebratory, and they always have the cameras there when they get released. That's an essential part of the PR. Now he's a suspect, right? Who was, who was cleared from his first wrongful conviction. So, so that was a big egg on the face of the wrongful conviction movement. And to ever left the comment about the different people who have had their convictions overturned by the Innocence Project only to reoffend again. And there have been a few of those that I've talked about mainly on Twitter, and they are absolutely right that I should do a show on all the people who have been released by the Innocence Project only to go on and reoffend. And boy, do those stories go away quickly. And to continue this narrative, not only that, not only to preserve the wrongful conviction movement, not only does making a murderer aim to preserve the good name right, of the wrongful conviction movement, but it also aims to further this narrative that our police force is so corrupt, our justice system so unfair, and these people will not be happy until the entire justice system crumbles and it's a kangaroo court, like what we have here and this is about, I always say to myself, like, this is as good as it gets. Like, it's only going to get worse as long as this movement ha has power. And so he went from that to, let's look at uh, just a little teaser from, from convicting um, a murderer. Coming up on convicting a murderer. Part of me don't want to believe that he did this. The blood that was on that back area was indicative of a head wound. My brother likes to push a lot of people around. I don't give a f about anything. I ain't got to listen to nobody. How were these filmmakers able to convince so many people that a man like Stephen Avery is innocent? How many times did he stab her? Once. And show me where. Right here. 
They gave him power. They're trying to get everything around me that they can. It's not good for an Avery to have power. I had told you all along, keep your fucking mouth shut. That can hurt, Stephen. I'm not going to lie for him no more. I can't do it. Watch Convicting a Murderer, a new 10-part series on Daily Wire Plus. Coming up on... Okay, so to that, like, how did they convince so many people? Not, why are we in the throes of a massive wave of innocence fraud? <laughs> why is every single piece of true crime media about a wrongfully convicted person? And why do they, why do they get more absurd as time goes on? Where we're having, I mean, serial... I mean, both in both these cases, we have a co-defendant who gave it all up, said everything. And in both these cases, in serial and making a murder, I'm talking about, we have a situation where you have to have a conspiracy theory so enormous to make it true that it boggles the mind, no? So that's what I think I have for today. Just a quickie. Um, thank you. Thank you, W. Lawson. Oh, you have a question. Do you think Stephen Avery acted alone? Have you ever looked into the stuff with Bobby Dassey opinions? Yeah, I think, I think Stephen Avery. No, I don't think he acted alone. I think he had Brendan Dassey's help. And that's a thank you for that question and thank you for the the super chat everyone's assuming that brendan dassey is a well-meaning victim what if he's a quiet psychopath i mean i just find it very hard this is where i'm stuck Brendan Dassey comes, so no, I have looked at the Bobby, da I just don't think, I mean, I don't know all the stuff you're talking about with Bobby Dassey, but I don't think, I mean, if, send it to me. Yeah, I think my email address said, send me what you have. Um, the stuff I'm aware of is more of the Bobby Dassey did it alone, Zellner stuff, the police waited in the bushes and, you know. Bobby Dassey waited in the bushes. I don't know who waited in the bushes and stole Stephen Avery's blood while he was shaving. That's where I was last when I last visited this. But <laughs> and uh, oh, MW, thank you so much for the super sticker. I appreciate it very much. So, yeah, no, I, I think that Stephen Avery was, is a, is a run of the mill psychopath. Sorry. And I think he's, I agree with the judge. I think he's a very dangerous person. I think he's very dangerous to women. And I, I, I don't think, and I'm, and I'm very grateful that he's still in prison. And it really looked like he might have some movement on this case in the beginning when it was such a whirlwind and the press helped. How about the press too? How about their part in this? Because they were cheering it on and they show a clip of Trevor Noah saying like, oh yeah, making it a racial thing. Like black people understand being framed because we're, it's obvious we're framed all the time. I won't give any examples. I'll just throw it out there. Like everybody knows I don't need to prove my point. It's just is right. That's a luxury, it seems like, that side has. So, yeah, I, I don't understand where, why, why we're pretending that this phenomenon happened as a one-off when it's so obviously part of a larger, bigger phenomenon. And it's not the fact that, yes, it is. It's part of it that Joe Blow Schmo in Alaska believes that Stephen Avery is innocent and gets riled up about it from a Netflix doc. That is part of the problem if they go on and advocate. But it's really the people 
who are making this movement run, the lawyers at the at these wrongful conviction charities, right? That's part of it. The lawyers that represent these clients the, and the media that participates along and, and never tells the other side of the story continues with the Stephen Avery is innocent narrative, the Amanda Knox is innocent narrative, the Adnan Syed is an innocent narrative, the Julius Jones is innocent narrative, the West Memphis Three is innocent narrative, the Chris Cooper is innocent narrative, the Luke Mitchell is innocent narrative. How many, how many more of these can we have? All with, all with a documentary or a podcast. So that's what I have for today. I hope you guys have a really good rest of the weekend and I'll see you back here next time. We'll go a little bit, a little bit deeper, but this is my central issue. And obviously with this documentary is that it's like kind of skirting over some really interesting issues that they could go over and ignoring the elephant in the room which is clearly the movement that is that created this documentary which i'd call the wrongful conviction movement all right have a great one everybody see you back next time